The Man Eater of Jaulagiri by Kenneth Anderson. Read by Apratim Viraj Singh. Those who have been to the tropics and to jungle places will not need to be told of the beauties of the moonlight over hill and valley that picks out in vivid relief the forest grasses and each leaf of the giant trees and throws into still greater mystery the dark shadows below where the rays of the moon cannot reach, concealing perhaps a beast of prey, a watchful deer or a lurking reptile, all individually and severely in search of food. All appeared peaceful in the Jalagiri forest range, yet there was danger everywhere, and murder was afoot. For a trio of poachers who possessed between them two matchlocks of ancient vintage had decided to get themselves some meat. They had cleverly constructed a hide on the sloping banks of a water hole and had been sitting in it since sunset, intently watchful for the deer, which sooner or later must come to slake their thirst. The hours wore on. The moon at the full had reached mid-heaven, and the scene was as bright as day. Suddenly, from the thicket of evergreen saplings to their left, could be heard the sound of violently rustling leaves and deep-throated grunts. What could be there? Wild pig, undoubtedly? A succulent meal and flesh in addition that could be sold. The poachers waited, but the beasts whatever they were, did not break cover. Becoming impatient, Muniappa, the marksman of the trio, decided to risk a shot. Raising his matchlock, he waited till a dark shadow, deeper than its surroundings, became more evident, and fired. There was a snarling roar and a lashing of bushes, followed by a series of coughing, woofs, and then silence. Not pigs, but a tiger. Fearfully and silently the three poachers beat a hasty retreat to their village there to spend the rest of the night in anxiety as to the result of their act. But morning revealed that all was apparently well, for a male tiger just in his prime lay dead, the chan's shot from the ancient musket having sped straight to his heart. So Muniappa and his friends were, for that day, the unsung and whispered heroes of the village. But the next night produced a different story. With sunset came the urgent, angry call of a tigress seeking her dead mate. For it was the mating season, and this tigress, which had only just succeeded in finding her companion the night before, was decidedly annoyed at his unaccountable absence, which she quite rightly connected with the interference of human beings. Night after night for a week she continued her uneasy movements, calling by day from the depths of the forest and in darkness roaring almost at the outskirts of the village itself. Young Jack Leonard, who was keen to secure a trophy and who had been summoned to the village by an urgent letter, arrived on the morning of the eighth day and acquainted himself with the situation. Being told that the tiger wandered everywhere and seeing her many pug marks on the lonely path to the forest bungalow, he decided to try his luck that evening, concealing himself by five o'clock behind an anthill that stood conveniently beside the path. The minutes passed, and at 6.15 p.m. dusk was falling. Suddenly, there was a faint rustle of leaves, and a loose stone rolled down the bank a little to his right. Leonard strained his eyes for the first sight of the tigress, but nothing happened. The minutes passed again and then, rapidly moving along the edge of the road towards him, and on the same side as himself, he could just discern the form of the tigress. Hastily transferring the stock of his rifle to his left shoulder, and leaning as far out from his sheltering bush as possible so that he might see more of the animal, Leonard fired at her chest, what would have been a fatal shot had it carried a little more to the right. As it was, Leonard's bullet ploughed deeply into the right shoulder, causing the beast to roar loudly before crashing away into the jungle. Bitterly disappointed, Leonard waited till morning to follow the trail. There was abundance of blood everywhere, but due to the rocky and difficult country interspersed with densely wooded ravines and close, impenetrable shrubbery, 
he failed to catch up with his quarry. Months passed, and the scene changes to Sulekunta, a village deeper in the forest and about seven miles from Jolagiri, where there was a little temple occasionally visited by pilgrims from the surrounding region. Three of these pilgrims had finished their devotions and were returning to their home, a man, his wife, and son aged sixteen. Passing under a wild tamarind tree, hardly a quarter mile from the temple, the boy lingered to pick some of the half-ripe acid fruit. The parents heard a low growl, followed by a piercing, agonized scream, and looked back to see their son carried bodily in the jaws of a tiger as it leapt into a nala bordering the lonely path. The aged couple bravely turned back and shouted abuse at the marauder at best as they could, only to be answered by two more shrieks from their only son, then all was silent again. Thereafter, death followed death over a wide area, extending from Jolagiri in the extreme north to the cattle pen of Gundalam, thirty miles to the south, and from the borders of Mysore state, twenty miles to the west, to the main road to Denkanikota for about 45 miles of its length. Some 15 victims, including three girls, one just married, had fallen a prey to this monster when I received an urgent summons from my friend, the sub-collector of Hosur, to rid the area of the scourge. Journeying to Jolagiri, where the sub-collector had told me the trouble had begun, I pieced together the facts of the story, deducing that this was no tiger but a tigress, and the one that had been robbed of her mate by the poachers and later wounded by Leonard's plucky but unfortunate shot. From Jolaguri I tramped to Sulekunta in the hope of coming across the fresh pug marks of the marauder, but I was unlucky, as no kills had occurred at that place in recent days, and what tracks there were had been obliterated by passing herds of cattle. Moving on to Gundalam, twenty-three miles away at the southern limit of the affected area, I decided to pitch camp, since it was at this cattle pen that the majority of kills had been reported, seven herdsmen being accounted for in the last four months. Three fat buffalo calves had been very thoughtfully provided as bait by my friend, the sub-collector. I proceeded to tie them out as likely spots in the hope of securing a kill. The first I tethered a mile down the river, bordering Gundalam, at that time of the year a mere trickle of water, at a point where the river was joined by a tributary named Sige Halla, down which the tigress was reported to keep her beat. The second I tied along the path to the neighboring village of Ancheti, four miles away. The remaining calf I secured close to the watershed, whence both herdsmen and cattle obtained their daily supply of drinking water. Having myself uh, attended to the securing and comfort of these three baits, I spent the next two days in tramping the forest in every direction, armed with my point four zero five Winchester, in the hope of picking up fresh pug marks, or perhaps of seeing the man-eater herself. Early in the morning of the second day, I located the footprints of the tigress in the soft sand of the Gundalam River. She had descended in the night, walked along the river past the watershed, and my buffalo bait, which as was evident by her footprints, she had stopped to look at, but had not even touched, and up and across a neighboring hill on her way to Uncheti. Here the ground became too hard for further tracking. The third morning found me searching again, and I had just returned to camp, preparatory to a hot bath and early lunch, when a group of men, accompanied by the headmen of Uncheti, arrived to inform me that the tigress had killed a man early that morning at a hamlet scarcely a mile south of Anchetti. Apparently a villager, hearing restless sounds from his penned cattle, had gone out at dawn to investigate and had not returned. Thereafter his brother and son had followed to find out the cause of his absence, and at the outskirts of the cattle pen had found the man's blanket and staff, and indistinct in the hard earth the claw marks of the tigress's hind feet as she reared to attack her victim. Being too alarmed to follow, they had fled to the hamlet and thence to Anchetti, where, gathering strength in numbers and accompanied by the headmen, they had hastened to find me. 
Forgoing the bath and swallowing a quick lunch, we hastened to Anchetti and the hamlet. From the spot where the tigress had attacked, and, as was evident by the fact that no sound had been made by the unfortunate man, had killed her victim, tracking became arduous and slow, owing to the hard and stony nature of the ground. In this case, the profusion of thorny bushes among the shrubbery assisted us, for, on casting around, we found shreds of the man's loincloth impaled on the thorns as the tigress carried him away. Had the circumstances not been so tragic, it was instructive to learn how the sagacious animal had endeavoured to avoid such thorns and the obstruction they would have offered. Some three hundred yards away she had dropped her burden beneath a thicket at the foot of a small fig tree, probably intending to start her meal. Then she had changed her mind, or perhaps been disturbed, for she had picked her victim up again and continued her retreat towards a deep nala that ran southwards towards the main Kaveri River some thirty miles away. Thereafter, tracking became easier, for the tigress had changed her hold from the man's neck and throat. This had accounted for the lack of blood spur. Now she held him by the small of his back. Drops of blood and smears across the leaves of bushes and thickets now made it comparatively easy for us to follow the trail, and in another hundred yards we had found the man's loincloth, which had completely unwound itself, and was hanging from a protruding sprig of wait-a-bit thorn. Continuing, we reached the Nala, where, in the soft dry sand, the pug marks of the tigress were clearly imprinted, with a slight drag mark to one side, evidently caused by one of the man's feet trailing downwards as he was being carried. As there was no need of a tracker, and numbers would create disturbance, apart from needless risk, I crept cautiously forward alone, after motioning to the rest to remain where they were. Progress was of necessity very slow, for I had carefully to scan the heavy undergrowth on both banks of the Nala, where the tigress might have been lurking, waiting to put an end to her pursuer. Thus I had traversed two bends in the Nala, when I sighted a low outcrop of rock jutting into the Nala bed itself. Keeping as far as possible to the opposite side of the rock, I increased the stealth of my approach. Closer scrutiny revealed a dark object on the far side of the rock, and this duly proved to be the body of the unfortunate victim. The tigress had already made a fair meal, having consumed about half her prey in the process, severing one leg from the thigh and one arm, Having assured myself that she was nowhere in the vicinity, I returned to the men, whom I summoned to the spot to help construct some sort of a place where I might sit up and wait the return of the assassin to its gruesome meal, which I was confident would be before sunset that day. A more unsuitable spot for sitting up could hardly be imagined. There was a complete absence of trees on which a hide or machan could be constructed, and it soon became evident that there were only two possibilities. One was to sit close to the opposite bank of the Nala, from where the human victim was clearly visible. The other was to ascend the sloping outcrop of rock to a point some ten feet above the bed of the Nala, where a natural ledge was formed about four feet from its upper edge. The first plan I rejected as being too dangerous in the case of a man-eater, and this left me with the prospect of sitting upon the rock ledge from where I could only view the cadaver, but the whole length of the nala up to its bend in the direction from which we had come, and for about twenty yards in the other direction, where it swung abruptly to the right. Working silently and quickly, at a spot some distance up the nala, whence the sound of lopping would not be heard, the men cut a few thorny branches of the same variety as grew in the immediate vicinity of the rock so as not to cause a contrasting background. These they deftly and cunningly arranged below the ledge, so that I would not be visible in any direction from the Nala itself. Fortunately, I had had the forethought of bringing my own blanket, water bottle and torch, although there would not be much use for the last of these during the major portion of the night, as the moon was nearing full and would rise comparatively early. By 3 p.m. I was in my place, and the men left me having been instructed to return next morning with a flask of hot tea and sandwiches 
for a quick snack. The afternoon wore slowly on, the heat from the blazing sun beating directly on the exposed rock and bathing me in sweat. Looking down the nala in both directions, all was still and nothing disturbed, the rays of shimmering heat that arose from the baked earth. Absence of vultures could be accounted for by the fact that, in the position the tigress had left it beneath the sharply sloping rock, the body was hidden from the sky. About 5 p.m. a crow spotted it, and by its persistent cawing soon attracted its mate. But the two birds were too nervous of the human scent actually to begin picking the kill. Time wore on, and the sun set as a fiery ball beneath the distant rim of forest-clad hills. The crows flapped away, one after the other, to roost in readiness on some distant tree in expectation of the morrow when, overcome by hunger, they would be more equal to braving the feared smell of human beings. The cheering call of the jungle cock broke forth in all directions as a farewell to the dying day, and the strident mow of a peacock sounded from down the dry bed of the stream. I welcomed the sound for I knew that in the whole forest no more alert watchman than a peacock could be found and that he would warn me immediately of the tigress's approach should he see her. Now was the expected time, and with every sense intently alert I awaited the return of the man-killer. But nothing happened. The peacock flapped heavily away and dusk rapidly followed the vanquished day. Fortunately, the early moon had already risen, and her silvery sheen soon restored a little of my former range of vision. The birds of the day had gone to roost by now, and their places had been taken by the birds of the night. The persistent chuck chuck chuku of night jars resounded along the nala, as these early harbingers of the night sought their insect prey along the cooling banks. Time passed again, and then a deathly silence fell upon the scene. Not even the chirrup of a cricket disturbed the stillness, and my friends, the night jars, had apparently gone elsewhere in their search for food. Glancing downwards at the human remains, it seemed that one arm reached upwards to me in supplication, or called, perhaps, for vengeance. Fortunately, the head was turned away, so that I could not see the frightful contortion of the features which I had noticed earlier that afternoon. All at once, the strident belling of an alarmed sambhar broke the silence and was persistently followed by a succession of similar calls from a spot I judged to be about half a mile away. These were followed by the sharp cry of a spotted deer and echoed up the nala by a restless brain fever bird in his weird call of brain fever, brain fever, repeated in rising crescendo. I breathed a sigh of relief and braced my nerves and muscles for final action. My friends, the night watchmen of the jungle, had faithfully accomplished their task, and I knew the tigress was approaching and had been seen. The calls then gradually died away. This meant that the tigress had passed out of the range of the collars and was now close by. I strained my eyes on the bend to the right, twenty yards down the nala, around which, at any moment, I expected the man-eater to appear. But nothing happened. Thirty minutes passed, then forty-five, by the hands of my wrist-watch clearly visible in the moonlight. Very strange, I thought. The tigress should have appeared a long time ago. She would not take forty-five minutes to cover half a mile. And then a horrible feeling of imminent danger came over me, Many times before had that obscure sixth sense, which we all possess but few develop, stood me in good stead in my many wanderings in the forests of India and Burma and on the African veldt. I had not the slightest doubt that somehow, in spite of all my precautions, complete screening and absolute stillness, the tigress had discovered my presence and was at that moment probably stalking me preparatory to a final spring. In moments of danger, we who know the jungle think quickly. It is not braveness that goads the mind to such quick thinking, for I confess that at this moment I was very afraid and could feel beads of cold sweat trickling down my face. I knew the tigress could not be on the nala itself, 
or below me, or I would have seen her a long time before. She might have been on the opposite bank, hidden in the dense undergrowth and watching my position, but somehow I felt that her presence there would not account for the acutely growing sense of danger that increasingly beset me. She could only be above and behind me. Suddenly it was borne home to me that the four-foot wall of rock behind me prevented me from looking backwards unless I raised myself to a half-crouching, half-kneeling position which would make a steady shot almost impossible apart from completely giving away my position to any watcher on the opposite bank or onto the Nala bed itself. Momentarily, I cursed myself for this lack of forethought which now threatened to become my undoing. As I hesitated for another second, a thin trickle of sand slid down from above, probably dislodged by the killer, now undoubtedly very close above me and gathering herself for a final spring. I hesitated no longer. I forced my numbed legs to raise me to a half-crouching position, simultaneously slowing the cocked point four zero five around till the end of the muzzle was in line with my face. Then I raised myself a fraction higher till both of my eyes and the muzzle came above the ledge. A fearful sight revealed itself. There was the tigress, hardly eight feet away, and extended on her belly, in the act of creeping down the sloping rock towards me. As our eyes met in surprise, we acted simultaneously, the tigress to spring with a nerve-shattering roar, while I ducked down again, at the same moment contracting my trigger finger. The heavy blast of the rifle, level with and only a few inches from my ears, mingled with that demoniacal roar to create a sound which often till this day haunts me in my dreams and causes me to awaken, shivering with fear. The brute had not anticipated the presence of the ledge behind which I sheltered, while the blast and blinding flash of the rifle, full in her face, evidently disconcerted her, deflecting her aim and deviating her purpose from slaughter to escape. She leapt right over my head, and in passing her hind foot, caught the muzzle of the rifle a raking blow, so that it was torn from my grasp and went slithering, butt first, down the sloping rock to fall dully on the soft sand below where it lay beside the half-eaten corpse. Quicker than the rifle, the tigress herself reached the Nala bed, and in two bounds, and another coughing roar, was lost to view in the thickets of the opposite bank. Shocked and hardly aware of what had happened, I realized I was unarmed and helpless, and that should the tigress return on her tracks, there was just nothing I could do. At the same time, to descend after the rifle would undoubtedly single me out for an attack if the animal were lying wounded in the bushes of the opposite bank. But anything seemed preferable to indecision and helplessness, and I dived down the slope to retrieve the rifle and scramble back, expecting at each second to hear the awful roar of the attacking killer. But nothing happened, and in less time than it takes to tell, I was back at the ledge. A quick examination revealed that no harm had come to the weapon in its fall, the stock having absorbed the shock. Replacing the spent cartridge, I fell to wondering whether I had hit the tigress at all, or if I had missed her at ridiculously close range. Then I noticed something black and white on the ledge behind me and barely two feet away. Picking it up, I found it was a major portion of the tigress's ear which had been torn off by my bullet at that close range. It was still warm to my touch and being mostly of skin and hair hardly bled along its torn edge. To say that I was disappointed and chagrined could not describe one-tenth of my emotions. I had failed to kill the man-eater at a point-blank range, failed even to wound her in the true sense. The tearing off of her ear would hardly inconvenience her beyond causing slight local pain for a few days. On the other hand, my foolish miss would teach her never to return to a kill the second time. This would make her all the more cunning, all the more dangerous, and all the more destructive, because now she would have to eat when she killed, and then kill again when she felt hungry, increasing her killings beyond what would have been normally necessary. She might even alter her sphere of activities and remove herself to some other part of the country where the people would not be aware of the arrival of a man-eater and so fall easier prey. 
I cursed myself throughout that night, hoping against hope that the tigress might show up again, but all to no purpose. Morning and the return of my men found me chilled to the marrow, disconsolate and disappointed beyond expression. The hot tea and sandwiches they brought, after my long fast since the previous forenoon, followed by a pipeful of strong tobacco, somewhat restored my spirits and caused me to take a slightly less critical view of the situation, which, after all, might have been far worse. Had it not been for my sixth sense, I would undoubtedly have been lying a partially devoured corpse beside that of the previous day's unfortunate victim. I had something to be really thankful for. Approaching the spot into which the tigress had leapt, we cast about for blood spore, but, as I had expected, found none, beyond a very occasional smear from the damaged ear against the leaves of bushes, as the tigress had retreated from what had turned out for her a very surprising situation. Even these we eventually lost some distance away, so that it was a very unhappy party of persons that returned to the hamlet and Anchetti, and eventually Gundalam, to report a complete failure. I remained at Gundalam for a further ten days, persistently tying out my buffalo baits each day, although I had little hope of success. Whole mornings and afternoons I devoted to scouring the forest in search of tracks, and nights were spent in sitting over water holes, game trails, and along the bed of the Gundalam River in the hope of the tigress showing up, but all to no avail. Parties of men went out in the daytime in all directions to secure news of further kills, but nothing had happened. Apparently, the tigress had deserted her haunts and gone off to healthier localities. On the eleventh day, I left Gundalam, tramping to Ancheti and then Ganikota. From there I travelled to Hosur, where I told my friend, the sub-collector, of all that had happened, and extracted from him a promise that he would tell me immediately of further kills, should they occur, as I now felt myself responsible for the welfare of the people of the locality. Then, leaving Hosur, I returned to my home at Bangalore. Five months passed during which time I received three letters from the sub-collector telling me of vague rumours of human tiger kills from distant places, two being from across the Kaveri River in the Coimbatore district, one from Mysore state territory, and the fourth from a place still further away. Then suddenly came the bad news I feared, but had hoped would not eventuate. A tiger had struck again at Gundalam, killing her eighth victim there, and the next evening had snatched from the very door of the little temple at Sulekunta, the old priest who had attended to the place for the last forty years. The letter concluded with the request to come at once. Such urgent invitation was unnecessary, for I had been holding myself in readiness for the worst. Within two hours I was motoring to Jalagiri. Arriving there, I was fortunate in being able to talk to one of the party of pilgrims who had almost been eyewitnesses to the death of the old priest of the temple at Sulekunta. Apparently, a party of men had been on pilgrimage, and, as they approached the temple itself, were horrified to hear the low growl of a tiger, which then leapt into the forest from the roots of a giant peepal tree that grew some thirty yards away. Bolting for shelter into the temple itself, they were surprised to find it tenantless, and looking out were aghast to see the body of the old priest lying within the folds of the gnarled roots of the old peepal tree that directly faced them. After some time, and very timidly, they approached in a group to find that the old man had apparently been attacked in or very near the temple, and then had been carried on to the spot to be devoured. The tiger had already begun its meal, consuming part of the skinny chest, when it had been disturbed by the pilgrim party. I particularly inquired as to whether my informant or his companions had noticed anything wrong with the tiger's ears, but obviously they had all been too frightened to observe any defects. I hurried to Sulekunta with my party of three, and arrived near dusk. I must confess that the last two miles of the journey had been very uncomfortable, traversing a valley between two steeply sloping hills that were densely clothed with bamboo. But we heard and saw nothing, beyond the sudden trumpeting of a solitary elephant, which had been inhabiting these parts for some time, and had been a considerable annoyance to pilgrims, 
whom he apparently delighted to chase if they were in small parties, but that is another story. There was no time to make a proper camp, so we decided to sleep in the deserted front portion of the temple itself, a proceeding which I, and very decidedly my followers, would have declined to do under normal circumstances. But nightfall and the proximity of a man-eater are apt to overcome all scruples and principles. I stood guard with a loaded rifle, while my three men frenziedly gathered brushwood and rotting logs that lay in plenty nearby, to build a fire for our warmth and protection, for on this occasion there was no friendly moon, and it would soon be dark. Under these circumstances, attempting to sit up for the man-eater in the hope of its passing near the temple would have been both highly dangerous and futile. Soon we had a bright fire blazing, on the inner side of which we sat, away from the pitch-black jungle night, which could easily have sheltered the murderer, all unknown to us, within a distance of two feet. Listening intently, we occasionally heard the deep belling boom of Sambhar, and I could discern the harsher note of a stag, but these did not follow in persistent repetition, showing that the animals had not been unduly alarmed by any such major foe as the king of the Indian jungle. After midnight, we arranged to keep watch in twos, three hours at a time, and I elected with one of my companions to take the first turn. The other two were soon asleep. Nothing untoward happened, however, beyond the fact that the solitary tusker, who had approached near enough to catch a sudden sight of the fire, trumpeted once again and crashed away. A cocker, or barking deer, uttered its sharp cry around 2 a.m., but as this was not continued, I decided it had been disturbed by a wandering leopard. Three o'clock came. I awoke the last two sleeping men and in turn fell into a dreamless sleep to awaken to the early and spirited cry of a great jungle cock saluting the rising sun. Hot tea, made with water from the well nearby, and some food gave us new life and heart, after which I walked across to the giant people tree and inspected the remains of the old priest. The vultures by day and hyenas and jackals by night had made a good job of him, for nothing remained but a few cleanly picked bones, at the sight of which I fell to reminiscing about the old man who had tended this temple for the past forty years, looking daily upon the same view as the one I now saw, hearing the same night sounds of Sambhar, Kakar, and elephants as I had heard that night, and was now but a few bones folded in the crevices of the hoary people tree. For the next hour, we cast around in the hope of finding pug marks and perhaps identifying the slayer, but although we saw a few old trails, I could not with any certainty classify them as having been made by my tigress. By 9 a.m., we left on the long 23-mile trek to Gundalam, where we arrived just about after 5 p.m. Here, upon making inquiries about the recent killing, I gleaned the first definite information about the slayer from a herdsman who had been attending to his cattle at the same watershed where I had tied my buffalo bait on my last visit. This man stated that he had had a companion with whom he had been talking and who had then walked across to a nearby bush to answer a call of nature. He had just squatted down when, beyond the bush, the devilish head of a tiger arose with only one ear, soon to be followed by an evil striped body. The man had shrieked once when the fangs sank into the face and throat, and the next instant tiger and victim had disappeared into the jungle. Here at last was the information I had been dreading, but somehow wanting to hear. So after all, it was now confirmed that the killer was none other than my old enemy, the tigress, who had returned at last to the scene of her former depredations, and for whose return and now vastly increased cunning I was myself responsible. Everywhere I had heard reports that no cattle or buffaloes had been killed by this beast, so I did not waste time, as on the previous occasion, in setting live baits, realizing that I had an adversary to deal with whom I could only hope to vanquish in a chance encounter face to face. For the next two days I again searched the surrounding jungle, hoping by luck to meet the killer, 
but with fear and dread of being attacked from behind at any moment. Pug marks I came across in plenty, especially on the soft sands of the Gundalam River, where the familiar tracks of the Jaulagiri tigress were plainly in view, adding confirmation to the thought that by my poor shot, some five months ago, I had been responsible for several more deaths. At midday, on the third day, a party of men arrived in a lather, having covered the thirty miles from Jalagiri to tell me of a further kill, this time the watchman of the Jalagiri forest bungalow, who had been killed and half-eaten within a hundred yards of the bungalow itself the previous afternoon. Hoping that the tigress might retrace her steps towards Sulekunta and Gundalam, as she was rumoured never to stay in the same place for more than a day after making a human kill, I left with my men at once, augmented by the party from Jolagiri, who, although they had practically run the thirty miles to Gundalam, preferred the return tramp of twenty-five miles to Sulakunta, protected by my rifle, as opposed to returning by themselves. Again, we reached the temple of Sulakunta as daylight was fading, and as the nights were still dark, repeated our campfire procedure within the temple itself. Our party had now been increased to twelve, including myself, a number which, although it made us feel safer, was far too many for my personal comfort. This time, however, we were not to spend a peaceful night. The Sambhar and Kakar were restless from nightfall, and at 8.30 p.m. we heard a tiger calling from a spot I judged to be about half a mile away. This was repeated an hour later from quite close and I could then easily distinguish the intonations of a tigress calling for a mate. The tigress had also seen the campfire and become aware of the proximity of humans, and, obviously hoping for a meal, she twice circled the temple, her repeated mating calls being interspersed by distinctly audible grunts of anticipation. All this gave me an idea by which I might possibly succeed in keeping her in the vicinity till daylight, at which time... Only could I hope to accomplish anything. Twice I gave the answering call of a male tiger, and received at once the urgent summons of this imperious female. Indeed, she came to the edge of the clearing, and called so loudly as almost to paralyze us all. I was careful, however, not to call while she was in the immediate vicinity, which might have aroused her suspicions. At the same time, I instructed the men to talk rather loudly and not overstoke the already blazing fire, instructions which were doubtlessly most unwelcome. I hoped by these means, between mating urge and appetite, to keep the tigress in the vicinity till daylight. She called again, shortly before dawn, and, congratulating myself on my ruse, as soon as it became light enough to see I hastened down the path towards Jaulagiri, where, but a quarter of a mile away, stood the tamarind tree beneath which the boy had been killed over a year ago, and which I had already mentally noted as an ideal setting-up place, requiring no preparation. Reaching the tree in safety, I clambered up some twelve feet to a crotch, which was reasonably comfortable, and provided a clear view of the path at both ends. Then, expanding my lungs, I called lustily in imitation of a male tiger. Nothing but silence answered me, and I began to wonder if after all the tigress had moved on at dawn. A new anxiety also gripped me. Perhaps she was near the temple, waiting for one of the men she had marked down the night before to come out of the building. Before departing, I had very strictly enjoined my companions not, on any account, to leave the temple, but I felt anxious lest any of them disobey me, perhaps in answer to a call of nature, or to get water from the well that was temptingly near. I called a second time. Still no answer. After a short interval, and expanding my lungs to bursting point, I called again. This time I was successful, for my voice penetrated the intervening forest, and was picked up by the tigress, who immediately answered from the direction of the temple. I had been right in my surmise. The willy animal had gone there to look for a meal. After a few minutes, I called a fourth time, and was again answered by the tigress. I was overjoyed to find that she was coming in my direction in search of the mate she thought was waiting. I called twice more, 
my last call being answered from barely a hundred yards. Leveling the rifle, I glanced along the sights to a spot on the path about twenty-five yards away. I judged she would take less than thirty seconds to cover the intervening distance. I began to count, and as I reached twenty-seven, the tigress strode into full view, inquiringly looking for her mate. From my commanding height in the tree, her missing ear was clearly visible, and I knew that at last, after many tiring efforts, the killer was within my power. This time there would be no slip. To halt her onward movement, I moaned in a low tone. She stopped abruptly and looked upwards in surprise. The next second, the point four zero five bullet crashed squarely between the eyes, and she sank forward in a lurching movement and lay twitching in the dust. I placed a second shot into the crown of her skull, although there was no need to have done so. Actually, the second shot did considerable damage to the head and gave much unnecessary extra work to the taxidermist. The dreaded killer of Jolagiri had come to a tame and ignominious end, unworthy of her career, and although she had been a murderer, silent, savage, and cruel, a pang of conscience troubled me as to my unsporting ruse in encompassing her end. There is not much more to tell. My eleven followers were elated at the sight of the dead marauder. Soon a stout sapling was cut, to which her feet were lashed by strong creeper vines, and we commenced the seven-mile walk to Jolagiri, staggering beneath the burden. Because of the man-eater's presence, no humans were afoot until we practically entered the village itself. Then word went round and throngs surrounded us. I allowed the people a short hour in which to feast their eyes on their one-time foe. While I retired to a tree some distance away, where hot tea soon refreshed me, followed by some food, and two comforting pipes of tobacco. Then I returned to the village, where willing hands helped me to lash the tigress across the rear seat of my two-seater Studebaker to begin my homeward journey, with the comforting thought that I had lived down my error and avenged the deaths of many human beings. The End